right. I'm not going to ask you to turn to any particular scripture uh, yet. I want to uh, pick up basically where I left off last week. This is Roman Catholicism part two. For those of you that have not been with us, we are comparing cultures, worldviews, religions, and uh, we're taking two. two sessions on Roman Catholicism. Of course, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big religion. Uh, but if you were with us last week, I have to tell you the truth, it's a false religion. And uh, it has truth mixed with falsehood that often has been taken out of paganism. And uh, I think some of the worst kind of falsehood that uh, we can ever come upon when, it, when, when we're talking about uh, uh, spiritual truth is that which is truth mixed with error. If it's all error, it's easily identifiable. But if it's uh, truth mixed with error, then it becomes a little more subtle and uh, it becomes more deceptive. And so that, that, I'm sad to say, is what we're dealing with here. Now, what I'd like you to uh, just follow for uh, a moment or two is uh, what is called the five solas. Uh, this is uh, out of the Reformation. There are five solas that, uh, and by that only, it means alone or only, that uh, grew out of what I talked about last week, the Reformation which was to, un, to correct the error in the Church of Rome. And these five solas, you'll see them up here. I just quickly want to go over them with you, but I, I want to focus in on just uh, two of them in particular. But you'll note, uh, uh, first of all, sola scriptura, or scripture alone. And that is that uh, the scriptures alone are the final and the highest authority and that everything that we learn from other sources has to be funneled through the Bible. And if those things don't match what the Bible says, if they contradict the scripture, then I'm sorry, we got to toss them out. Uh, first, I have a, a verse up there, I think, uh, uh, Scoot up on that, uh, please. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, it basically says, don't add anything uh, past the scripture. The scripture alone is sufficient. And so that's the first point. And then the second point is sola fide. Up, please. Sola fide is faith alone. That's a second point that came uh, out uh, from the reformers out of the Reformation and that is that salvation is dependent on faith uh, alone and uh, not on anything else that we are saved from our sins by faith in Jesus alone and uh, it's not by faith in anything that we do or someone else does for us the third one if we can go up again is uh, sola gratia or grace alone and of course that is that we are saved from our sins and from God's judgment by his unmerited and unearned favor there is nothing that we can do or have done that can cause God to be more gracious to us it's, it's all uh, his grace on our behalf the next one is uh, sola Christos, which is Christ alone, and that is that Jesus is the only means of salvation. Remember he said, I am the way, the way, the life, the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the only means of salvation. He is the only mediator, remember? There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and that God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus, 
and no one else is God in the flesh as Jesus is. John 1, uh, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then uh, uh, the last one is uh, sola deo gloria, the glory of God alone. And uh, the fact for that is that God alone is the one who is to receive all the glory. He's the author and finisher of our salvation. And uh, he's the one that works all things for good through our lives. And we are to live for him and glorify him. And uh, not the church, uh, not the pope, uh, not the priest, not the pastor, not ourselves, but him alone. Okay, so that's uh, quickly the five solas, if I can call them that, that uh, the reformers put forth as a result of the error that they were uncovering in the Roman Catholic Church. This was back in about the 1500s. Now what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is just focus in on the first two, which is uh, sola scriptura, uh, that is scripture alone, the Bible, its sufficiency, and then sola fide, or faith alone, that is salvation by faith apart from any works. Before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have once again to talk about these things and this truth. We thank you that we have a Bible that so clearly reveals to us the facts regarding itself and the way of salvation because this is what is so crucial in this whole matter. And I pray that you'll guide us this afternoon in the minutes that we have together and that we would accomplish uh, what we've just talked about, that it would be to the glory of God alone and not to any man. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. So, as we go to this first point, that scripture alone, uh, we talk, let's just talk about uh, the authority of the Bible. The reformers said that scripture alone is the final and the highest authority for what we believe and uh, how we live. And uh, yet the Catholic Church, here's what they say. They say that it is scripture plus sacred tradition. That is their rituals, uh, their practices. Sacred tradition to the Roman Catholic uh, Church is just as uh, equal, is of equal value, I should say, with the scripture itself. You go along with that? Absolutely not. And you can't find biblical proof for that. When the Bible uses the word tradition, it's talking about the teachings of the apostles in the New Testament. And it's not talking about uh, man-made human traditions that the church, I said, has instituted, and many of them have pagan roots as well. And uh, so in the Council of Trent, which interestingly enough, uh, went for almost 20 years from 1545 to 1563 and the reason being the Council of Trent was in three parts and it covered all the dogma uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. In the Council of Trent, 1545, they rejected, the Roman Catholic Church rejected scripture alone and retained the right and retained the power to interpret the Bible according to tradition and practices that the Roman Catholic Church accepted. Okay, so, I mean, we're going back a long time that the, that the Roman Catholic Church has rejected the sufficiency of the Bible, biblical sufficiency. We know what the Bible teaches. We know that the Bible teaches that it alone is sufficient uh, and has authority for all areas of human life. Someone said that um, you can only trust a church 
to the extent that that church is true to the Bible. I agree with that. And I don't think that any church is perfect. I don't think that any church has a perfect, uh, foolproof interpretation of the Bible. Hey, we're all still learning. The truth of the matter is, we're all still learning. I don't have a corner on the truth any more than anyone else does. And I don't hold myself up as uh, the only one that knows what's right. And uh, everyone else, if they don't agree with me, then they're, they're wrong in their heritage. I don't, but that's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. That's what they teach. And, uh, and yet, they are the ones that have added to the Bible their traditions. And of course, we talked about the Apocrypha last week. They have added books to what is called the Canon of Scripture the 66 books that are recognized as, uh, as the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church to this day does not trust their people to properly understand the Bible. Now they've changed a little bit in that now they will allow you to read the Bible, but they do not encourage you to interpret the Bible. What we are having on Saturday, our ladies' Bible study, where we're trying to teach the ladies how to personally interpret the Scripture, that is, that is not something that the Roman Catholic Church would ever encourage because they don't believe that uh, the average layman should have the ability or has the ability to interpret the Scripture. They say that only the magisterium does. You remember that word? The magisterium is the, the, the leading body, teaching body of the Roman Catholic Church made up of the cardinals and the Roman Catholic theologians headed up by the Pope. Only they can rightly interpret the scripture according to Roman Catholicism. And so the average person like you and I can't. Now wait a minute. What does the Bible say? In John chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus said, When the he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will what? He will guide you into all truth. And he's talking to the, the apostles, of course, but he's talking to all believers. We can accept that truth personally because we are indwelt by the same Holy Spirit the, the apostles were. And so we can interpret the scriptures by being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and listening to him and uh, being led by him. And so the, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they find the Bible as the basis for their dogma by interpreting the passages of the Bible to mean what they want it to mean or by implication. For instance, did you know that the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary, Mary was immaculately conceived just like Jesus? Jesus we know that scripture teaches was virgin born well the roman catholic church teaches that so was mary that she was miraculously conceived that's nowhere found in our bible but that is roman catholic tradition and that is on equal value with the bible in their teaching where did they get that well if it's if they don't find a verse that teaches that they'll find a verse that they think implies that and uh, of course they they really are are digging deep to find anything that would... Uh, they also teach that uh, she, um, she was assumed bodily into heaven. The bodily assumption of Mary. And uh, again, nowhere found in Scripture, but they will use maybe a verse where, remember when Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind uh, in a fiery chariot to heaven? They'll say, see, it, it happens. And so, because Mary, they say, is without original sin. And so she didn't have to die. So she's assumed bodily to heaven. She doesn't have to go through death. Nowhere is that taught in the scripture uh, regarding Mary. Of course, there is the doctrine that came out in the 1870s that the uh, papal infallibility, that the Pope, when he speaks in his official capacity, that he is without error that he is infallible, that what he says is as binding as the Bible. That's the kind of authority. Okay, you get the point? No wonder the reformers 
talked about sola scriptura, the sufficiency of the Bible, that it alone is the standard by which we live and upon which we believe. Second thing, if you'll scoot up to uh, sola fide, uh, faith alone. Now, the Roman Catholic heresy is that is this, that salvation, they say, depends on faith plus good works. Faith plus good works. And uh, particularly, the good works is that you participate in the seven sacraments, or if you're not uh, going to the priesthood or nunnery, at least six, uh, six of, those, uh, uh, of those sacraments. That's how you add these good works to your faith, and other things as well. They say that through faith plus good works, God makes you righteous. God makes you righteous. That's their definition of being justified. They are saying basically that faith in Jesus alone is not enough for salvation. The Church of, of Rome teaches that faith lays the foundation, but you're required to build upon that foundation good works to earn your justification before God. You earn it. Now, they, of course, would use passages like 1 Corinthians 3, which are not pertaining to salvation, but are pertaining to rewards that believers uh, earn uh, as, uh, for their service, their ministry for the Lord. Two different things altogether, but they use that to, to uh, teach this heresy that faith alone in Jesus is not enough. It has to be with these good works. Two of the most important of these seven sacraments would first of all be what is called the Eucharist. And the Eucharist, we call it communion, right? Or the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Eucharist, you have to understand, in the Roman Catholic teaching is much more than you and I, much farther than you and I would ever go. We understand the Lord's Supper or communion as what? It's just remembering the Lord's death, right? It's just a memorial, so to speak. But in the Roman Catholic Church, when the priest says his, uh, his spiel over the host, the wafer, and the cup of wine, they teach that that turns that wafer and that cup into the literal body and blood of the Lord. And so... They call it a representing of Jesus. In other words, it's a re-sacrifice of the Lord Jesus every time that Eucharist, that Mass, is celebrated. And so that is a blasphemy. Because what does the Bible say? Well, we'll get to it in a moment. But I just want to present this to you first. And then an, an, another uh, important sacrament in the Roman Catholic Church, not only Eucharist, but what is called penance penance. And don't, re, don't confuse penance with repentance, even though uh, the words, uh, it's the same root word. Penance in the Roman Catholic Church is that through confession to a priest, all your sins will be forgiven that you have committed after baptism. You see, the Church of Rome teaches that when you're baptized as an infant, all your original sin is uh, erased. So what do you do after, you, uh, you, after you've been baptized to deal with sin that happens after your baptism? You go to confession. And that takes care of any sin after uh, baptism. So that's what, that's what they teach. That's, that's a second very important uh, sacrament in the church. They also uh, uh, teach about purgatory, and that is that uh, with the exception of martyrs and uh, those who have attained sainthood, Roman Catholic people are taught that they have to pay temporal punishment in a place called purgatory. 
And it's interesting, purgatory in Roman Catholic teaching is described as a place of both suffering and joy. And they say that it is a place where the soul is burned and, uh, and purified by the love of God uh, and you shed self-love through purgatory. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.3 that after he had purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of God. That's purgatory in the biblical sense. It is not some place of suffering and joy, but it's rather the purgatory, the purging that Jesus accomplished for us in our place on that cross. And that was once and final, the Bible says. And by the way, it also, um, it also teaches the fact that that verse says, when he had by himself purged our sins, it didn't take anyone else to assist him in that uh, purging. And yet there are people uh, that uh, are taught by the Roman Catholic Church that there, is a such, there are such things as indulgences, which uh, brings pardon for sin, and that you as a living person can shorten the time in purgatory for dead uh, friends or loved ones by praying for them, by paying to have masses offered for them, uh, by doing good works on their behalf. What does the Bible say? That he by his blood washes us from our sins and that he by himself purged our sins. Someone uh, told me last week after we did Roman Catholicism Part 1 that uh, they were told as a child that uh, uh, when they asked, how long will I have to spend in purgatory, the nun told this person, oh, about 10,000 years. <laughs> Where does that come from? Again, it just they pull that right out of, air, uh, out of the air. Uh, it has nothing to do with the scripture and uh, what the Bible says. Here's a, here's a great blasphemy also, and that is that Mary is considered to be a co-mediator with Jesus. Now we know what the Bible says, right? That there's one mediator, not two. Not Jesus and his mother. There is one mediator between God and man, and that one mediator is none other than Jesus the Messiah. That's what uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says. And again, the scripture uh, is clear because not only do they believe that she is a co-mediator with Jesus, but they, the Roman Catholic Church teaches she is a co-redemptrix with Jesus. That is, she's a co-redeemer. When he had by himself purged our sins. Impossible. There's no co-mediator. There's no co-redemptrix. If you go by what the Bible says, here's the biblical accuracy. The Reformation taught that it was by faith alone that we're saved from our sins by faith in Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing and that Jesus is the proper object of our faith, nothing else and no one else, and that it is total dependency upon the sacrifice of our Savior on that cross for our sins, and that when we trust him, when we depend upon him, the Bible says that we are justified by faith, Romans 5.1 tells us, and the word justified means that in God's eyes he declares you righteous. You're not made righteous uh, uh, when you're justified. You're declared righteous. There's a difference between the two. However, throughout your lifetime on this earth, the Holy Spirit of God is working in your soul to make you more and more righteous. To make practical, to make actual and functional in your life what is already said to be true of you in the eyes of God. 
If I could put it this way, man is three parts, right? Spirit, soul, and body. The moment you're born again, your spirit is made righteous. True holiness. Scripture teaches that. During this lifetime, your soul is being made righteous. It's being sanctified. And when Jesus comes and uh, you're giving a new body, then your body will be made righteous as well at that time yet in the future. So this is, this is what the, the difference is. But it is Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice that is eternally sufficient. Listen to the way the writer of Hebrews puts it. He says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And then he says this. Um, so, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And as you then travel down in the chapter that follows, chapter uh, 10 of Hebrews, it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And uh, so it makes it very clear that by Jesus' offering himself once for, for all, his uh, sacrifice was eternally sufficient. It's eternally sufficient. There's no need for any more sacrifice. And uh, he did it again by himself. And so works cannot be added to faith to equal salvation. It's not faith plus works equals salvation. It's faith alone. It is sola fide. Faith alone that equals salvation. It's faith in the right object, that is the Lord Jesus, and in what he accomplished, his work on the cross. So where do good works come in? The, well, they come in the Christian life. They come in after salvation. The Bible says that they are a result of being justified by faith. The Bible says that we are to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Got the picture? He works salvation in you. He saves you by faith. And then that faith is evidenced in good works. It's put uh, in just a, a little bit different terms in our famous uh, passage in Ephesians chapter 2. He says that, uh, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, that's salvation. Created in Christ Jesus, that's, that's your salvation unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, you see how, how it uh, is put in Scripture? It's faith in Jesus and His work alone that saves. But if you're saved, it's going to be revealed in good works. And it is those good works. It's your, your service for the Lord. It's your life for the Lord that's going to be rewarded one day at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is all about. It's not about purgatory. And uh, it's not about some of these other things that we've talked about. So, at this point, I'm almost done. I have to apologize for how long I went last week. I couldn't believe it. Uh, the, the afternoon was longer than the morning. And I determined I was not going to do that again. We started at quarter after 12. We're going to end by quarter after 1. And we'll probably get done before that. Question? Yes, Ed? Uh, they call uh, their experience with the Holy Spirit. I know because I'm pretty well versed in that doctrine. Yeah. Uh, it occurs during what they call the ceremony of confirmation. Right. And the doctrine that you call the Eucharist, that is called transubstantiation. Right. And their hopes and fallibility came about when the Pope start, stopped raising war, when he stopped mounting a horse and leading a Christian army against infidels, 
When you stop doing that, that's when they instituted the doctrine of the Okay, very good, Ed. Thanks. Liz? They don't question that the nuns I spoke to could not answer questions or answer them in a way that a child could never answer. Right. They never questioned authority. Right. And I tried to tell, I tried to witness gently that Mary had more than Jesus as a child. She yeah. had more children. Right. And the person looked at me as if I just grew up horns and a tail. Right. Amos. Yeah. <clears throat> it seems like, uh, tell me if I'm right, that Satan uses the news media uh, to promote uh, Catholicism. Like, uh, let's say, for example, when you see a holiday, a big holiday, they only show, like, the uh, whatever, this uh, St. Patrick's Day. They never come to a small church, a Baptist church, they, and they call them the faithful, like, uh, as if to say, like uh, this small church, the Baptist church is right. not the faithful. Right. Why don't they come like over here? So they're, they're promoting, uh, they're promoting the Roman. Would you say that? Well, they promote a lot of bad things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would say that would be one. Yeah. Yeah. The, the news no, I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, obviously. Obviously. Well, the world loves its own. That's the bottom line, all right? And we're not of the world, and so the world doesn't love us, and so we don't get the 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 hype, and that's okay. It seems like the Catholic Church. Would. Uh, promotes and controls everything. You have to be uh, saved. You have to depend. Oh, you mean the, they control everything in a Roman Catholic's yeah. life? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's how religion works. Everything is Think true. about it. That's how false religion works. Bible Christianity gives people space, gives people liberty, gives the Holy Spirit the opportunity to deal with people as individuals. Religion says, nope, you got to be cookie cutter. This is the way it is. If you, you can't, uh, you can't depart from this, or you're not, uh, you know, you, you don't have any hope. Church to go to heaven. Yeah, absolutely. The church, you know, yeah. Wanna... yeah. And, and by the way, uh, you might be watching this, uh, or you might be here, and uh, think that that makes you okay. It doesn't, does it? No, just because you're in church or you're uh, you're well, you're spiritually minded about this stuff, that's not what it takes to have a relationship with God. And going to heaven is just a fringe benefit of having a relationship with God. That's what it's all about, because that's where He is, and that's what uh, we're looking forward to. But in closing, let me just quickly give you, I hope, what, that will be some practical tips for witnessing to Roman Catholic people. Tip number one, avoid the peripherals. We talked about some of the peripherals today I, because I just wanted you to be informed. Avoid the peripherals. That is, you know, don't talk about the assumption of Mary, the immaculate conception of Mary. Don't talk about those, perif those peripheral issues because that's a distraction. What you want to do is direct the conversation to the main issue. And the main issue is this. How do you think, what is a Christian? How do you think that a person can have eternal life and be certain that they're going to go to heaven someday? That's the main issue. Don't get hung up on all these other things, bashing the Catholic. If you bash any person's religion, you're turning them off. That's not the way to win them. Just because you know these things, you need to know these things, but you don't use that against them, okay? The issue is their salvation. The issue is that they know how they can have an eternal relationship with the Lord and thus a place in heaven someday. And uh, so I ask them that, and I also ask them this. If you died five years from today, are you 100% sure that you have eternal life and will go to heaven? And I use that distant date because if you're a Roman Catholic or any religion for that matter that, that uh, is based upon doing certain things, you never know if you've completed them. You're never sure if you've done enough. You can't ever be sure. So they might be, in their own thinking, in a state of grace at that moment, but what about five years from now? Well, they don't know. And so 
I ask them that. If you died five years from uh, today, are you 100% sure that you have eternal life and you go to heaven? And um, because, see, their assurance, if they have any at all, is based on, on things that haven't happened yet. <laughs> Good works. So they can't tell me that. No one can know that. And in fact, the Roman Catholic Church officially teaches that if you say that you know that you have eternal life, you're guilty of the sin of presumption. And that's, uh, that's serious. And so they don't, they'd never say that. But then you can take them to 1 John 5.13. And, and John says in that passage, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, listen, that ye may know that you have eternal life. You know what? The Bible says you and I can know whether or not we have eternal life. We can know it now. Would you like to know? And then, having established that, you can show them the, the, uh, uh, the reality of sin, the problem of sin, the penalty of sin. The thing that you have to hammer is that the payment for sin is paid in full. First of all, they need to know what sin is because the Roman Catholic Church divides between venial and mortal sins. Venial sins, that's what you go to purgatory for. Mortal sins, uh, I guess you can get them forgiven, but if you don't get them forgiven, that you go to hell for them. Okay? You die with mortal sin on your soul. Yeah. That's what extreme unction, which one of the seven sacraments is about. Extreme unction is an anointing uh, on the deathbed of, uh, of uh, a Roman Catholic to take care of any mortal sins that uh, may not have been uh, dealt with. And so anyway, they, they try to cover all the bases. But um, so after you establish uh, what sin is and the penalty for it, you have to show them that that penalty was paid 100% by Jesus. Because what the Roman Catholic Church uh, basically teaches is that Jesus paid a percentage, but you got to pay the rest. How much did he pay? Oh, it depends on who you're talking to, what priest you're talking to. Maybe one priest would say he paid 95%. You've got to pay off the other 5%. You have to show them that Jesus paid it all. Yeah. They truly don't really believe in the forgiveness of sins. Because when you look at the, the crucified Jesus, the image of the, of the God man hanging on the cross, they do not recognize. I, I, in my experience, as far as in the Roman Catholic system, and I was raised in the traditional Roman Catholic system in the 1950s, yeah. that, uh, that there's certain sins that you could that are indelible, that, that you know that they're completely negating what is the truth of the gospel. And yeah. I'm going to tell you something. All sober-minded people have to realize this: from the empire of Constantine, when they first recognized Christianity in 324 AD, all through the Holy Roman Empire, they amassed a tremendous institution that affected worldly governments, they had a lot of power. They did not want, it was the mind of man without God, they didn't want to give it up, and that's all it was. They built up what I want to relinquish their power to the God of creation. That's what it is. They, they say, God, this is God, this is your word. We have to go by your word. Yeah. Because that, that's all the only doctrines are from the mind of men. Everyone. Oh. Exactly right. You're exactly right. Ed, you should be up here teaching it. <laughs> I, 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 I went through this. I, I, I used to, in the eighth grade, I used to talk about this stuff, and they would, they would tell me that I needed my wings clipped and all this stuff. Yeah. 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 Couldn't, couldn't question it. They say that the Bible, or some of them, is a guide. It's not. Uh, it's not the right. inherent word of God. Right. It's a it's guide. It's a guide. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. Any other comments or questions before we uh, wrap it up, uh, Cheeto? Uh, what's the difference between our Bible and their Bible besides the Apocrypha? Yeah, the Apocrypha is the big difference, but not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. There's some words that they have deliberately, you know. Uh, change to make it say, for instance, instead of repentance, it may say penance, do penance. Instead of repent, 
they'll say do penance, which is a, a work, working for your salvation. That, you know, so there's, but uh, it's very similar, very similar. Yeah. But for Americans, and, and forgive me if I hope I don't offend anyone, but to see what the Catholic Church has covered up, what they've done to children, covered up rampantly in losses of war, yeah. how could any, any parent think, oh, this is good to put my children in? Yeah. Because it's covered it up well, that's why. <laughs> and it's just starting to, uh, you know, to fall apart. Yep. I had no idea as a Catholic child why Jesus was Jewish. Why Jesus was what? Jewish. Jewish, uh-huh. No uh -huh. idea about yeah. Israel. Yeah. I had no idea. Well, do they even tell you he's Jewish? They don't tell you. Yeah, Probably they, not. They, they, don't, they hide no. it. They right. make you think Israel and Jews are the reason why he's yeah. Right. Well, exactly, exactly. The Roman Catholic Church has been anti-Semitic, you know, from the beginning. Okay, so, yeah. Absolutely. Because we talked about, when we touched on the Inquisition last week, we, someone mentioned the fact that not only did they persecute heretics uh, in the church, but they persecuted Jewish people as well. Yeah. They're looking better. Yeah. All right. I think we're, we're, we're done.